So today's speaker uh, is uh, Doug Given, as I said, partner at Bay City Capital, which is an active investor in the life sciences industry. Since its formation in 1997, Bay City has managed seven venture funds, representing $1.6 billion ca in capital invested in over 85 companies. Doug joined Bay City in October of 2000, and he's held the CEO and other senior executive positions in a number of private and public biotech companies. Uh, including Mallinckrodt, Progenitor, Mercator Graphics, NeoRx. Um, he's also held senior operating positions at Shearing Plow Research Institute, Monsanto GD, Searle Research Laboratories, and Lilly Research Laboratories. Um, he's the chairman of Via Pharmaceuticals and Vivaldi Ph Biosciences, and also of the visiting committee for the University of Chicago Medical Center, uh, Division of Biological Sciences. He's a member of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Advisory Board and the Harvard School of Public Health AIDS Initiative International Advisory Council. He holds an MBA, uh, I'm sorry, an uh, MD and a PhD from the University of Chicago and an MBA from the Wharton School. Uh, he was also a fellow in internal medicine and infectious diseases at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. So tremendous uh, experience. We're honored to have you uh, here today, um, and I turn it over to you, Doug. Thank you very much. I'm not sure. I think you're all mic, so I don't think you need this. Is this live? Ah, good morning. Uh, you know, you might say, why would I want to do this, or why did I come to do this? I would just make it clear. I love being part of institutional groups networking and you know supporting Wharton on the West Coast uh, is a lot of fun. There's a great you know group of alums, a great group of uh, business people that are active. They come through our office on a regular basis. We try to sponsor student groups who are interested in venture capital and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I want to just thank Doug for working with me to uh, schedule this and also uh, Ken Hartunian for the outreach and identifying uh, you to me as well. Uh, I know this is a group with many different backgrounds. I scanned the names and realized when I came in I didn't recognize one of you. So you're all uh, new friends. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I think that uh, in, in putting together something to tell you today, I wanted to be sure that I touched on a number of things that really had to do with kind of street smarts or the way we practice finance and the way we practice valuation. Uh, obviously the, the theory of this is, is is well known to all of you. You've been formally educated uh, in it. Uh, and I thought it might be interesting to see how much of this actually is involved in the venture investing model and the venture investing practice. Uh, as a consequence, I put really uh, four uh, things uh, into the deck. There are 40 slides. I think I want to talk about seven or eight of them and hopefully interact with you. But I wanted you to have something you could take with you. You also could look at uh, and you know it might generate some questions. So as I scan through these, it gives you an opportunity to just piggyback onto anything that's interesting. And I'm happy to do this as a dialogue. It's, after all, your workshop. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So that's enough of an overview about Bay City. I'll say just a couple of more things just to frame our activities. But I, I've got five things in the deck. One is an overview of Bay City, just so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, the VC investment process highlights come from a deck, uh, in a sense, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs and want them to understand us. And when you want to talk to a venture capitalist, uh, what do you need to do and how do we think? Uh, there's a case study about Vivaldi because I wanted you to see uh, aspects of some of the valuation tools that we typically use at Bay City that we've developed over time. And, and not all firms do this. Uh, and uh, you'll see how that works. We're kind of a large firm, almost a corporate structure. We have nine investment partners, but we have 30 people in the firm. So this is not six guys, you know, on, on Sand Hill Road. This has uh, a lot of capability. We do a lot of modeling. We're financially driven. We're objective, quantitative driven investors. There's uh, always the subjective fall in love with it, qualitative investing. But I wanted you to see uh, what we're trying to do. We're modeling a lot of uncertainty, so who knows if we get it right. But it makes us feel better that we're at least trying to handicap what we're doing in terms of getting to the exits with these investments. Uh, 
I'd like also to tell you that there's been, you know, a dramatic change in the environment. Uh, getting people to focus on anything these days, you know if you're trying to raise money, is really tough. The macro uh, activities that we're all dealing with are so disruptive, and there's been a major shift, we call it a paradigm shift, in healthcare investing. And Bay City has really captured that in the two slides I put in the deck for you. Our thinking about where the valley of death is and where the breakdown in the value chain for investing uh, and maintaining healthy capital structures in these innovative companies are. So I'm not going to have time. I could just spend, uh, you know, an hour on those two slides, and uh, you know they're visually, I think, very helpful, and, and I'll try to use those just to. Uh, show that to you. I know a lot of you are probably IT investors as well or entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't do that and in fact our firm uh, doesn't do that. Uh, so I have one slide in there which is a compare and contrast and you know what we could spend the whole hour just on that slide of investing in life science or biotech compared to IT. So you're going to see that this is going to be a struggle as we go along. I I'll try to move through each of the uh, th through each of the chapters here. And I think probably the most interesting is the last chapter, so we'll save some time for that. That's simply five or six slides about a typical investment uh, meeting on Monday morning. The way we run our, our, our firm is we only have one scheduled meeting uh, a week, and it runs Monday morning, whatever length of time it takes. And uh, we look at uh, uh, the status of our portfolio on a rolling basis. We look at uh, companies that have just had board meetings. We look at new investments. We, of course, work on managing our portfolio. Uh, but again, whenever we come to the point of making a follow-on investment or making a decision about what's the best structure, uh, uh, how to price and, and, and what kind of paper to use, uh, we use the kinds of uh, modeling and so forth that you'll see in the last chapter. Uh, and you can just, you know, obviously we have to see what's best for us. Uh, how does that affect the previous money we put in the deal? How does that affect new money we're going to put in the deal? Uh, and is it you know, how, how aligned are we with other members of the syndicate? We get out of alignment with our syndicate all the time for reasons that just have to do with funds of different ages and funds with different reserves. And uh, I can kind of summarize venture investing for you this way. I can't remember a deal we've done that didn't take longer, cost more, and deliver less than we planned. And you know, we, we plan and we plan and we measure and we talk to ourselves and our models make us feel better, and yet they always have those characteristics. So, and, and we do this for a living. So it's fine that an entrepreneur is enthusiastic and motivated and selling, but we do it to ourselves. So as a consequence, almost every follow-on investment we do, even though we're, we're reserved for it, are under conditions entirely different than what we were expecting when we put the, the first investment into the business. And so the last chapter deals with the issue of, you know, the scenarios. You know, where are we with the milestones? What's, what's happened to the company and the environment? Okay, so we're calling an audible and we're changing the play at the line of scrimmage. So, you know, you, you probably know that, but uh, I, I thought that would be a way to structure uh, some interaction with you and, and the presentation today, and that's what's in the slides. So. Uh, Nobody has a first comment. We'll, we'll just go ahead. So Bay City, you know, we're a pretty good sized firm. Uh, we've been uh, active just doing life sciences. On a Monday morning, 30 of us in a room sitting around a board table, six or seven MDs, six or seven PhDs, six or seven MBAs. You know, interestingly, we don't have, we, I think we have one individual with consulting background, nobody with an engineering background. So we've gotten big and hefty in a very specific way which, you know, I'm not sure how firms grow or why they grow this way, but that's, that's the nature of our practice. We want to be value-added investors, so we're best when we stick to biopharmaceutical, biotech, medical devices, uh, molecular diagnostics. Uh, we don't do healthcare services, we don't do healthcare IT, typically, uh, and you can see why. It's an issue of competencies. So, but that said, imagine the, the interaction that goes on in these meetings, because there's so much experience in the room. We've got a dozen people who have been CEOs of major organizations including pharma companies and med device companies. So the practice meets the theory and meets the enthusiasm of innovation and it's always characterized by uncertainty. So 
there you have it. I think the, uh, the firm is easy to background check. Just go look at baycitycapital.com, and I won't, won't spend any more time on the firm itself. Uh, but the people, and given the way I've kind of introduced them, uh, you can have a look at that. Go ahead, Doug. Right. So I've just put one slide uh, in the deck, and uh, I'm not sure if our current um, basically overview of the firm presentation is on the website. But on the left side, you can see the sec uh, basically the sectors that we invest in, which I just talked about. More than half is biopharmaceutical, and you can understand why that is. We have an affinity for areas that we're comfortable in. On the right, you can see the stage. And this is the initial stage at the time that we formed uh, the first investment. And you can see about a third, our early stage, uh, about a fifth, uh, our mid stage, uh, and then the remainder, our seed and later stage. We obviously live with these investments a long time, five, six years, sometimes longer. So it may be something that started as a seed stage company. It may have gone all the way to commercialization. and. Uh, could have gotten into the, uh, uh, you know, all of the issues related to standard uh, valuation metrics that you guys have learned how to use. I, I think the point I wanted to make on the investment team is simply that we've been together a long time, and uh, I think we make that point as well. And the point I wanted to make uh, uh, with these slides before I move on is simply that we do a variety of different kinds of investments. We create new co's, like an entrepreneur would do, but we found those companies inside the bank. So that is a process that we're very comfortable with. I would say that you know, as many as a third of our companies are homegrown. We, we start them inside, we write the business plan inside, we seed them, finance them inside, we use our internal staff to do it. Obviously, we're partnering with whoever was the origin of the intellectual property, typically a university professor. Uh, we build these to the point where they're ready to be syndicated in the Series A. So we go through the same process. I like that because I know where the seed money is coming from. It's a lot easier, I think, than putting together uh, an enterprise and then going out and shopping it, trying to attract that first uh, venture investor or first small syndicate. We also do traditional syndicated uh, venture investments that are brought to us by others. Uh, or that we take out to others. We do turnarounds and restructurings, uh, which uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of opportunity to do that, particularly in the last decade. Uh, and we do public company investing. And, and the bank was originally formed as a merchant bank. So as a consequence, we have a lot of capital market experience and we're comfortable doing different kinds of investments and we think we can exit and move with the environment pretty flexibly. Uh, and I think that's one of the strengths of the firm. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about was just the, the venture capital model and the venture capital process. And you know, these slides are real easy to read, so I'm, I'm going to leave that largely to you. But you know, we, with a fund, right now we're investing out of a $500 million fund. It's a 2007 vintage year fund. So we're a little over halfway into the investment commitment period. Uh, you know, I'm assuming a certain amount of awareness of how venture works, but uh, I want to just overview that briefly. The, when we raise a fund, it's typically a 10-year fund, and the commitments are really a call for capital from the limited partners as needed, but we make all of the company initial investments in the first five years of the fund, and we make no further new investments after year five. And then in years five through 10, we work on follow-on investments in the portfolio we've generated, and work towards the exits for all of those investments. So in, in the process of getting later in a fund where we are now, we take a look at how we deployed our funds. You know, and we may say we need more later stage investing to balance the risk in this portfolio, or we've got room for a, a couple of earlier stage investments. Uh, maybe we could stick more to medical devices because of the uh, often the shorter period to uh, exit uh, in those because they have to fit into the 10-year horizon for that fund. Uh, also, uh, there may be a need for early return uh, uh, of capital uh, as we start thinking about fundraising for the next, uh, for the next firm funds. Uh, and again, then we start working towards um, you know, low-hanging fruit where we can exit those investments because without the returns, you don't have the track record to generate the next fund. 
So that's very brief primer, but as a consequence, we're always setting priorities and have play selection. And you as an entrepreneur, when you, when you approach a group like us, uh, it's, it's hard to know often, but you need to try and handicap where are we in our fund process and what, you know, are you going to be too early stage for where we are at this point with getting towards the end of the investment period of a fund and realizing every investment we make, we start with the exit and work our way back to the front. We look at how much capital we think it's going to take from the tail end to, 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 to get to the point of the exit. Uh, in the biopharmaceutical space, maybe, maybe you can sell in the 250 to 500 million dollar you know, bracket. We pretty much think that's, that's, that's what you can expect to do. So if you're trying to earn a venture return, which is three or four X cash on cash, you just can't push more than 100 million into that investment and still hope to earn a venture return. So, you know, we've, we, we have to work within these constraints or we can't, or we can't make our, our projected returns. Uh, another thing I didn't say about the funds is that typically we're shooting for a 3x cash on cash or better return for a fund. So if it's a $500 million fund, which fund five is, you know, we need to generate um, uh, a billion and a half just to get, we need to generate two billion just to get to a 3x, 3.8x cash on cash. And, Typically, that puts you in a sweet spot for raising your next fund. So if you think about how that math works, you can see why we work backwards from the exits. We look at how much we want to put in uh, or, and, and set aside in sort of the reserve process for additional later stage investments for each investment we make. Doug. Right. 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 So we, our limited partners, typically invest looking for an internal rate of return, an IRR. And you'll see when I go to the analysis at the end that we always side by side analyze both. But I just wanted to say that you know by the time you pay back the management fees and you pay the coupon. In this case, in this fund, 8% annually, uh, you know, you've got to outrun that and then earn a return on top of that. We pay, pay back all the capital invested, we pay back the coupon, and then what's left over is what gets split in the basically profit sharing or the carry for the firm. So, you know, we, we essentially have to have a 3.8 overall cash on cash return to generate a net 3x. So that's, that's a pretty high hurdle. Yeah, happy to. A little louder, please. So, uh, have you seen any changes in the coupon rate expectation from venture partners over the years as interest rates have gone down and economy? Yeah, it's it's a negotiation. Uh, you know, we 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 have uh, funds that that are lower and funds that are higher, and they show up as well in in dividends that we take. You know, on top of our investments from our portfolio companies, it's kind of a trickle down. But right now, I think our last fund was eight eight percent. Oh, it can be it can be four to fifteen. Sorry, I don't want to ask a question that everybody knows the answer to but me. But uh, what's what's this coupon mean in this case? Well, when when you as an LP, a family office, or uh, a um, um, you know a university endowment um, pledge money to the fund, so we then will take a management fee. In, in the case of this fund, it's two and a half percent per annum. And we, when we pay you back, we'll pay you back the management fees plus 8% dividend annually while we're using your money. And then what's left over becomes the, uh, be becomes the, you know, the profit, which is then typically split, in the case of this fund, 80-20. 80% of the profit back to the LPs, 20%. Uh, you could look at it that way. We pay it back. Okay. So, you know, again, I could spend the entire hour just on these five or six slides, but I wanted to say a little bit about how the industry works, knowing that not all of you are VCs or private equity investors. Um, I want to emphasize the point that we work from a milestone-driven operating plan and work backwards uh, from the likely exit valuation so we don't get trapped. 
we at least want to go into these investments and manage them, understanding our financial wherewithal and our time horizon for working our way through uh, to a successful exit in these, uh, in these investments. Uh, we're always trying to maintain a return that's greater than the risk. You know, I think the way you talk about this in the private equity is, you know, you, you're, you're always seeking alpha, right? You want, you want the return to be greater than the beta, uh, and, you know, you're going to be held accountable to the standard and poor 500 or whatever the benchmark is. And for the illiquidity, for the time that this money is tied up, the investor expects uh, to earn uh, a solid return, often three and a half, four points higher uh, than the usual benchmarks. Uh, and as a consequence, IRRs um, need to be in the high teens. Uh, we, we, we try to generate an IRR of 25% or higher uh, on, a, on a fund. And this is back to Doug's question. So capital efficiency, just to point out, we're a big fund. So this, we're not the kind of fund you come to for a project that you think start to finish is, is going to need $20 million in capital. We rarely invest alone. We syndicate. Uh, if there are two or three or four co-investors, uh, you know, a company that's going to use $20 million, $4 million from us, it's just not capital efficient. We'll spend as much time on that investment uh, as a larger investment. So given the size of the fund, we typically like to go into investments where on the order of $25 million uh, would be the expected um, capital that we would, we would push into that investment uh, before exiting. Uh, and we want to syndicate with others, so pick a number, 60, 80, 100 million. So we're working backwards from a model. And often the entrepreneurs are clueless. They don't have any idea what's over the horizon. They, they know what the next 12 months is or 24 <coughs> months are, but don't have the operating experience to understand how they're going to bridge to uh, a sale to a commercial organization. Now this is the slide I talked about earlier. And uh, I hesitate to do more than just put it up there because, again, we could talk a lot about it. And, you might get the wrong impression reading this that why would anybody do life science investing? But I just point out that IT and life science do have some significant differences. Uh, typically, there's more capital required for a life science investment than an IT investment. Uh, revenue growth uh, is often higher in the ramp faster in an IT investment uh, than in a life science investment. The holding period is shorter. The potential for even 20x returns in IT, not at all uncommon, very uncommon in life science. So what's, I guess what's different and what's not on the slide is, is the probability of success. Uh, you know, if you're running an IT portfolio, uh, you have a lot of early quick kills. And you, you may end up with three or four companies that uh, actually uh, get the investment pushed into them and make it to exit. You may, you may just shut down. Uh, two-thirds of these investments. I think in our 85 companies in the course of the 13 years we've been investing, we've written off five or six investments. That's it. So we're with these a long time, a lot of sweat equity. We work really hard to make them successful. And we kill ourselves to never lose our principal. We'll, we'll, we'll work just, just to get our principal back. So you need to understand what, what that means. And uh, it's a lot of hard work. And that's the way we work our way out of this sort of paradigm. But uh, I, I think as a consequence, the WIFI on the bottom is, you know, historically an IT fund uh, can absorb a lot of failures. I, life science funds can't do that. OK. Vivaldi is a flu company. You know, we've had this concern about uh, pandemic flu. We found some really outstanding uh, inventors with strong intellectual property at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. With the help of our scientific advisors, uh, we realized that their uh, IP was available. They weren't commercially tied up. And uh, we then said, flu, that's a commodity business, an, uh, oligopoly, an oligopoly of, of four pharma companies that sell all the flu vaccine. Government caps what they'll pay for it and buy a lot of it. Uh, these guys would, you know, like knuckle dragging fur on their fur on the, they'd rather kill you than cooperate or innovate or have any kind of change in their supply chain because they get paid seven dollars wholesale or ten dollars or if they're left, lucky fifteen dollars uh, for a flu vaccine. And uh, it's a commodity business. And so I get a phone call saying you really ought to do a flu vaccine. And I said you've got to be kidding. So, no, no, you know, a National Academy of Science 
chair of infectious disease at Harvard calls and says, no, no, the flu vaccine for the elderly is one of the most important unmet needs in medicine. We don't know this, but I'll tell you that all of the commercial flu vaccines are 50% less effective in people over 65, and 85% of the morbidity and mortality in flu uh, is in the over 65. And it turns out that probably 75 to 80% of the economic value of investment and products in flu is in the elderly. So they're selling us a lousy product. It doesn't, could you imagine if your antibiotic worked 50% of the time? But there hasn't been the technology to allow you to improve that. Older people's immune system senesces, it just stops working very well. It doesn't see the immunogen, so it doesn't have a good immune response. You don't know that because there's no motivation for the marketing teams to tell you how bad those, those vaccines are, how poorly they serve the market. So we said, well, okay, but can you make any money doing this? And how are you going to cause this industry structure to have to adopt this? So what we did is we vetted the clinical plan, went all the way to the point of milestones that we thought would be persuasive and would force industry uh, to acquire this, and then we went into um, a modeling exercise on valuation. And I, which, I want to show you part of this. This is a macro-driven, homegrown model that we built at Bay City together with the Pritzker organization, the, the private equity arm of the Pritzker family, uh, and in particular one of our analysts, um, and now venture partners, Brian Cunningham. This is a wonderful model. Um, it allows us to uh, understand uh, product value, market value, it's macro driven, uh, it's, it's statistically driven. There are probably 140 um, uh, cir circular um, uh, analyses that go on behind the scene. But I want to show it to you because it also allows us, anytime we want to sell a company or sell a product or do a corporate partnership, to completely understand where the economic rents are going. So everything is sensitivity tested. You know, what are you using for uh, the split of upfront payments, milestone payments, royalties? What are the discount rates? And what's the sensitivity against all of that? What is the market penetration model? What is the go-to-market sales force cost going to be? Now, how many entrepreneurs understand that about the commercial end of their business? They don't. They, they just don't. When we work with people like Pfizer, they try to buy our model. They like it better than their own, own models, and they have unlimited resources. So you get a sense of they're only as good as the information going into uh, the assumptions. So I'm going to show you a half a dozen or so slides on this model, though to present it to you or the way we would present it to a co-investor, it's a 140 slide presentation. So I've just selected cherry-picked pieces out to give you an idea of what these outputs look like. So this is the first thing about valuation. Let's ask a quick question. Do you only invest in companies that may have commercial, uh, that may have sales during the lifetime of your investment? No, in fact, we rarely do. Right. We rarely do. Because it's it's rarely possible to do that. So, um, but you still look at the commercial value after your exit in order to derive the valuation. Is that the right, because what what the buyer will pay is based on you know expectations. It's always expectations of, of it's just like investing in the stock market. You're paying on expectations of uh, value created in the future, right? So you're dealing with uncertainty. All right, I'll quickly take a, take a look at this model, and you can read these slides later at your uh, at your leisure. So the inputs and the outputs of the model, uh, it uh, includes, of course, understanding everything about the cost of taking the product through alpha and beta, or what we call phase one, two, and three testing to licensure. It deals with the uncertainty or the regulatory fa failure rate in a regulated, regulated environment like the FDA developing a new therapeutic, going from preclinical development to the clinical testing and then submitting and going through um, the FDA review process and licensing. It uh, has the capabilities I talked about uh, to work and, and tease out all of the rents going each direction um, when you're selling or when you're buying. We're always in licensing technology and we're always out licensing businesses or technology. It allows you to do value chain analysis, NPVs, sensitivity analysis, cash requirements, and the like. So, you get an idea of the complexity of the inputs and the outputs. Uh, in the case of developing a flu vaccine, yes? What are biobucks? Biobucks are uh, futures. So, okay. you know, what you don't get in an upfront licensing fee, for example, a $100 million deal, 
10 million up front, 90 million in milestones. As you move successfully through development, you may never get those milestones. So you go out and announce a $100 million deal, you only got 10 million. The rest is all at risk. So it's at risk uh, economics that you may not get. So they're, they gotta be heavily discounted, right? Okay, this just shows going through the stages of development for the flu vaccine, what the dates anticipated when we built the plan would be, what we thought the NPV was uh, at each of these stages based on basically discounting back the cash flows from the eventual commercialization in 2016 and beyond, a risk adjusted and a non-risk adjusted net present value. So we thought that, you know, look, we thought this asset was already worth $100 million when we went into the investment. And that if we could move successfully to the end of phase two, which is the point where we would have expected or would expect to sell this company, we thought we could generate a seven-fold increase in value. And of course, that's what we were investing into. Uh, this shows you then the analysis, uh, all the costs going in, risk adjusted, and then reaching the market, and then a typical penetration uh, curve for a well-marketed compound in a highly competitive space. And you can see the colors relate to the different age groups for vaccine. And the magenta happens to be the elderly. You can see just visually everything is driven by the elderly investment. You can't even reach a positive net present value in the pediatric, adolescent, and working age population. You can't afford to develop any new technology in flu. It has to be superior and it has to penetrate the elderly market, or this is a loser right out of the gates. So we knew at the beginning it had to be a superiority premise for the product. So, you know, our, our advisor, we thought, was right, and we could model that. Uh, this shows you the um, drug development pathway moving from early discovery all the way to approval and licensure when we start to sell. This is an eight to 10 year process, probably costs a billion dollars to take a flu vaccine all the way to commercial differentiation and launch like this. Well, I told you earlier, we can't afford to put more than 100 million in, sell it for 250 to 500. So somewhere along the line here, we gotta get out of this because you're not gonna raise a billion dollars in a venture-backed enterprise. So going into it, we know we're gonna get creamed if we don't get out of this on time. How do you determine the probabilities? Well, that's, it's, again, the probabilities are, are based on uh, economic analysis of, of, the, uh, uh, of the drug development process. There are a number of institutes that cover this, uh, economists at Princeton and elsewhere that model this, and we have a pretty clear idea of what the attrition rate will be. This characterizes the pharmaceutical industry. It turns out this is for a small molecule, you know, like the, the cholesterol uh, medication you might take. For a vaccine, you know more, you mo know more earlier because you're measuring antibodies uh, in the serum even of the first patients you begin to treat. So actually these success rates are higher in a vaccine. One of the things that made this less daunting for us uh, was that there are surrogate measures of success earlier in the process. But it's again all documented and it's footnoted at the bottom. So that's how we do it. So going from when we started this process, we thought we'd have a 75% chance of success showing that it was gonna work in animal models of disease. Once we did that, and we're between these two stages right now after running this company for three years, a 70% chance that when we actually went into clinical testing, it would look okay in the first, in the first human testing. So 70% of 75%, so only 50% chance of success. And we've pumped 25 million into this. So the expected value, you can think about this, it's gonna be worth zero or whatever the salvage value of selling the IP, or you know we're on a track to a $700 million exit. And you know we can carry this maybe for another 24 months uh, as a venture-backed business. So I hope you're starting to get hives because this is what happens to us every day. Um, Everybody in the room knows what a weighted average uh, cost of capital is. These are the kinds of companies that would buy us. So their general average and median, uh, uh, this, this analysis we performed three years ago was 9%. Uh, we used 13% um, 
a lot of debate about what to use in, in the model, but of course, in the sensitivity, we run it for all costs of capital. So I'm just trying to square the, your earlier slide comparing the life sciences, biosciences to IT and saying that you know, your tolerance for fail, failed investments is very low. Yes. With the slide you just showed that showed a composite probability of success through the span of your investment of roughly 50%. Right. How do those two sync up? That's pretty, that's better than one in 10 IT investment making it. But it's, but, ve it's venture investing. This, this, is, this is not commercial banking. But eight out of 85, I think you said, were... were Write-offs. Yeah. So if, 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 if you're on the wrong side of the 50% in the previous slide, is there significant salvage value that you at least get back your, your initial capital, it, so to speak? It's a restructuring. You might like the management team and their capabilities, and you may in-license uh, a related technology and take another shot on goal. You'll try to have a second or third technology uh, under the same tent so that it's not a one-trick pony. So I'm just showing you the probability for one product. It's the key value driver for the business, but there are a variety of strategies that we use to try and mitigate that. It's a good question. Uh, let me keep moving. So weighted average cost of capital, we use 13%. This then just goes through the commercial assumptions, again, uh, heavily researched because of the size of our portfolio and the commercial people in our advisory group. Uh, we uh, can parse this effectively, as effectively as a pharmaceutical company can. You can see in the U.S., uh, in the top right, there are 38 million elderly. It's growing about 3% a year. Uh, the vaccination rate is very high in the elderly, 80% though the vaccines don't work very well. Uh, we just you know, build up the uh, sales model this way, looking at peak penetration of 60%. Now to do that, you have to be in the number one position. There's no question it has to be better than what's out there, but we don't think it's very hard to beat the standard of what's out there in that age group. I've showed a price of $18, but of course, we can run a sensitivity on all of these. Just whatever number you plug in, it's. It, you, you come out with the new calculus. So that's what's so nice about the model. You can see we're showing a launch date of 2015. That means the first flu season uh, would be the 15-16 um, uh, flu season, okay? Um, and we started this investment process in 2006. So we're talking about something 10 years in the future, a billion dollar investment, and we can only take it part way. So you get a sense, again, of, of how we're running these investment probabilities. And so we're talking about what's this going to be worth later to the acquirer, and then how early can we push it into their R&D organization. So uh, this just shows you the ramp for the elderly segment sales uh, uh, with a little higher pricing. It easily meets a uh, billion dollar uh, uh, annual uh, sales run rate, and it does that by the early 2020s. Uh, that's a pretty good looking product. And remember the margins are terrific in pharmaceuticals. Uh, this just shows the model with the costs and the taxes and uh, uh, the go to market expenses and the net, net sales are shown um, uh, derived from the combination of revenues and all of the expenses. And then it's discounted. This is what you're used to. Discounted cash flows, right? And I told you we did this at 13%. Now this is not risk adjusted. And when I say risk adjusted, remember the slide where I showed you we have attrition going from preclinical to phase one to phase two, and this, this is the problem. So we analyze it both ways, risk adjusted and not risk adjusted. Each time we dodge a bullet and get to the next stage, you know, we put that risk behind us and we've climbed that valuation increment. And that's what the business is all about here. This shows it risk adjusted still at 129 million and this shows it non-risk adjusted. 700 million, and if we can get to this elderly segment successfully, this will be uh, a terrific investment. Uh, again, this just shows the net present value growth as you go during year to year to year as you go from, from preclinical to phase one to phase two to phase three. I said that I thought we could get this to phase two for under 100 million in investment for the syndicate. and we need to make a 3x or a 3.8x return on it. We're getting pretty close here. We, we modeled this, and we did this in 2008. So looking forward, you know, the, the calculus is still working. 
but you can get upside down in your capital structure really fast if you have delays and you put too much money in and it takes too long. And remember what I said, every single investment I've ever been associated with, well, one exception, took longer, cost more, and delivered less in terms of milestones. So, you know, it's, in a sense, it's wasting clean thoughts on dirty data. But, you know, we talk ourselves into these investments. Yes, sir? What's the definition of upside down? Not being able to see enough returns? Well, if, yeah, if you get here and you've got 200 million invested and you sell it for 300 million, you know, this is going to be, you know, 1.5x return. It, uh, given the time and an 8% annual dividend paid to the investor, there'll be no profit. Uh, just showing you the sensitivity analysis, the way we display that, this happens to be one of the 100 or so variables that we would test. This uh, uh, is around the probability of success of moving from each of the phases. Back to Jim's question. Okay, so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show you that we, we try to think quantitatively. We try to bring our domain experience into it to run models that we think uh, are, are going to give us an advantage in terms of what we can see, in terms of the potential, the investment, potential of the investment. And then that leads to really the play selection and the way we build a portfolio throughout, you know, throughout uh, the development of the fund's uh, investments. Question. How do you model? Right. Well, we just, each time we come to a financing point uh, or a change in a milestone, a delay, or FDA asks for more tests, so it's going to cost more and be a delay, okay? And we're just trying to get to a milestone. Uh, how do we do that? We it, just, each time we come to one of these, this is what we do every Monday morning. And with 30 companies actively falling off their milestones, you know, it's just, it's, you know, we're in the, we're working hard every Monday. And then we spend the rest of the week, you know, picking up the pieces and, you know, mentoring the management team and trying to help them understand what just happened to them, uh, talking to the syndicate and keeping them on board uh, with a, a situation that has probably deteriorated. Now, I can tell you, you know, if you follow Bay City, we had an interesting investment this year. Just there is the other side of the story. I'm just trying to show you guys as professionals how hard this work is. But we made a $10 million investment in Ion Torrent uh, in January last year. Uh, and it was acquired by Life Technologies October 1st. Uh, and it was acquired uh, for $700 million plus. It had some bio bucks, about a half up front and a half uh, in January of 2012, mostly for tax reasons. Uh, and it ended up being um, a 6x return. Uh, and that occurred in, in 10 months. And it's a high throughput DNA sequencing uh, play aimed at a thousand dollar genome where you could get your genetic information fingerprint 100% sequenced for a thousand dollars. They can do, you know, literally in a day now what the entire genome project uh, in the mid 90s running worldwide could do. That, that's the technology compression that, that we're enjoying in the field. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, some, sometimes, you know, you, you hit a home run. And, uh, uh, the, yeah, okay. So, let's see. We've got a little less than a half an hour. So, I'm going to go a little more quickly through the next two sessions, and then we'll just ask questions. You guys satisfied with that? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to show you two slides, uh, and I'm not <coughs> going to take you through each of the bullet points. This is a self-presenting slide, so you can read this later. But I wanted you to see what the investment paradigm for life science and healthcare investing, call this pharmaceutical drug de development, a little like the Vivaldi flu vaccine I just showed you. Um, early on, NIH is government, academia, Stanford, UCSF, uh, venture and pharma don't do a lot of real early investing. And we lever that. That public investment is what gets leveraged and is one of the reasons these venture investments can work. We're standing on top of, when we put our first 10 million in, often we're standing on top of 100 million of public sector investment coming from NIH and the best, the best research science staffs uh, in, in academia. 
But then you move into translational research, showing from the bench that you can get it to the bedside. And kind of the nomenclature for that is translational research. So how do you take um, what the great immunologist is doing and make that useful for a patient with autoimmune disease or cancer? And translational research has been one of the primary places historically where venture made its contribution. So we'd leverage and stand on the shoulders of this earlier investment. We'd do the translational research, and there often was not any government funding for this kind of applied research. This is sort of the engineering part of it, rather than the fundamental discovery part of it. And this is where venture steps up. And we'd continue into the first testing in humans, in this case, phase one. But you can see venture can't really afford it as you get further down the value chain, just like the Vivaldi example. So what's happening is you used to have an IPO market, and some of these you could, you could go to public capital fairly early, and pharma started buying these companies and then putting their developmental and global developmental resources behind it. And this was, this was kind of the daisy chain, and this is how we got paid in venture, and that's how products moved their way towards market. But um, this all fell apart with the destruction of the profitability of the pharmaceutical industry, patent term restoration, generic encroach, encroachment, um, the loss of profitability because of price controls. Putting that all together, we've managed to kill the industry. It's a mature industry. It's disappearing. Uh, and the innovation um, funding that was embedded in this golden goose uh, is inappropriately just been destroyed. So you're just watching your pharmaceutical industry um, uh, you know, disappear in terms of its capability of funding this kind of innovation. So there will not be the kind of innovation that we've enjoyed in our lifetimes going forward. It's just not possible. Society also can't afford to pay for it. So as a consequence, pharma has disappeared from this equation. This is a Bay City analysis, and this is what we think it now looks like. You go from the discovery to the translational work, and venture can't, can't do this because pharma has stopped buying in, in, in the midstream here. They're waiting until it's ready for the marketplace. They can't afford to pay for the innovation and the development anymore. They can, they're just turning into global distribution outfits. So, and they're outsourcing their discovery, but they're not paying for it. So venture has moved later because if we adopt earlier, you know, we can't stay inside our 10-year investment horizons and our ROI and our IRR and our cash on cash. We can't make it work. So there's a large valley of death for financing innovation, which has occurred. And we find ourselves now making later and later stage investments. So a significant change. Um, uh, you can, a lot of this has to do with um, j just, you know, ridiculous uh, uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, pricing requirements, the rest of the world not investing and in just exporting basic or importing innovation paid for by the American taxpayer. It's all coming apart. So this model right now is in disarray. This is what it looks like. And we have a number of strategies at Bay City addressing these issues. We're changing our investment behaviors, our fundraising behaviors, a number of things. But I wanted to make this um, available to you so you could you know, go home and you can read about uh, why, why this is happening and how this is happening, but it's food for thought. Question. Uh, just on the valley of death there, uh, do you, are you seeing trends in uh, geographical areas that don't have the regulatory problem that may be filling that gap, filling that vacuum? Yeah, what's happening is everybody has high growth in emerging markets. So taking what we've already invented and then selling it into untapped markets with growing middle, middle class consumers. So China and India are good examples, Southeast Asia. But uh, uh, I think that's, that's, that's the, the top line on this. In, in, in those emerging markets, are there, or is, there, is there an environment where that translational, I think you called it, area, or are they filling the gap where this is not happening in the US, but maybe it will happen in a place like India or China? Or is uh, the structure just not, not there for it? Uh, the, they're growing, the structure. And the, the cost of producing this kind of work is sometimes lower. Uh, there's an issue with the quality of the work. It's not, you know, getting to the point where it's going to be acceptable for 
advanced company, uh, country uh, regulatory scrutiny and so forth. We're in a transition, but uh, I wouldn't be looking for innovation. Business innovation, yes. Technology innovation, no. All right, so I just quickly put up, um, you know, whenever we're doing valuation exercises, we, of course, we have the usual sorts of things like um, uh, what's going to be the discounted cash flow, what's going to be um, the net present value as a consequence, what are the comparable companies going for, selling for, what is pharma or med tech paying for these innovations in these companies. And whatever investment we're doing, we pick the closest group of comparables that are relevant and recent, and that's one of the ways we, we benchmark. Remember, there's usually no product, no customer, no sales, no cash flow. We're just raising, why would you do this, right? So it's, we do it because pharma buys these companies, and this just shows you uh, uh, some precedent transactions in general for earlier stage, phase one and preclinical companies that were bought at the point that we could afford to finance a company like Vivaldi. And you can see that the mean price is 220 million and the median is 162 million. Remember I said in general they're selling for between 250 and 500. Well, those are com companies that become a little later stage, right? Like into phase two. But you can see the total amount invested in these companies, the years to exit, and if you think about what I said earlier about the way our funds work, you see why this is a difficult business, making this calculus work. Okay, the last thing I wanted to do is just Monday we were sitting around talking about a, uh, it was time to make a follow-on investment. Uh, series C uh, investment uh, needs to be followed now by either an IPO or a Series D investment. Those of you who don't do venture investing, uh, I just will tell you what the nomenclature is. The first money typically that we put in to help the entrepreneur write a business plan and secure a license to the intellectual property and hire some of the key founding management and so forth is typically called a seed round. And then the first institutional or syndicated investment is typically called a Series A. And as you'd imagine, a couple years later we do a Series B, a couple years later we do a Series C, and it's a race to the exit. Can you exit before you've used up all of your reserves? as a venture investor and can you exit before you kind of gotten upside down with the cap? You put too much money in for what the market will pay for this because of delays, because of technology failure, because of uncertainties. So we were faced with one of our portfolio companies needs to finance and one of the key things we always deal with is okay what companies on our list need to finance in the near future and I'm not telling you what company it is uh, and uh, so I just want to make you aware of kind of the way this process worked and works every Monday. So we have analysts. Our typical analysts um, uh, have worked on Wall Street as equity analysts or investment banking analysts uh, or M&A analysts for two, three years, sometimes longer. We hire them, they sit at a desk, and they model. And they can't stay at Bay City. They work for us two to three years and they're, they're out. So we rotate them through, then they go to business school. So our analysts do all this crunching. Uh, it's, there's nothing unique about it. It's what you do in every investment bank, but we do it at Bay City every week, every investment. Um, we had a choice here of what if we tried to do an IPO in September of 2011? Now this is a real case today. Now you guys know what the IPO market is like right now. And tried to do this at a pre-money valuation of 110 million and the insiders that have to buy this deal. It's not a healthy enough market. We're still going to have to invest to get this IPO off the ground. And our ownership of this investment will be diluted from 15.7 to 13.5 percent on a fully diluted basis. All right, so that's simple. You just model that. The alternative scenario was, well, what instead, or what if we can't do the IPO? Well, the insiders are going to have to put 40 million in they're going to have to do it by July so the company doesn't run out of money. We need to try to attract an external investor because we're starting to get to the end of the reserves for the current syndicate and some members of the syndicate can't even do the next investment because they're at the end of their fund. So if we do a Series D $40 million round, 
private investing, we know venture people won't pay over $75 million for this. By the way, the post money on the last round was $138 million. So look at the discounts. And we're deluding ourselves. $25 million bridge needs to go in now just to get this thing to July or September. A bridge is a loan. So now we're mixing debt with equity. $15 million in new investor money is needed to get the $40 million. So our $25 million bridge, and we need to find $15 million out there somewhere. And if I were the guy coming in, this, this is the, the classic you know, LIFO situation. Last in, first out. You know, so why does anybody invest in early stage financing? Because you can crush the earlier investors by just hanging out and coming out later. We do a lot of later stage investing for this reason. We like to be that 15%. I mean that 15 million. So then we got to take care of management as we dilute everybody. So you got to put another option pool in. And this calculation, you know, shows us being diluted again. And both have the assumption that this gets sold at the end of 2012. Either we sell our public stock or we sell the company privately in a trade sale to a pharma company. So, you know, we do Monte Carlo simulations. This particular product has two indications. Uh, that are in front of the FDA for it's still early development. If you only get the one indication, 186 million is the net present value. If you get both indications, it approaches 600 million, and we are trying to handicap what the FDA is going to say. And whether or not they'll act to move forward on the first indication, or in fact wait until we've developed the data on the second indication. Delay, more money fewer milestones. You're right back in the venture calculus. So again, I told you that the last round post money was 138 million. You can, you can see uh, how this analysis starts to break out. Now I'm just showing you uh, the sensitivity based on the price per patient. This happens to be an orphan drug, meaning very few pa patients. The annual cost to the insurer, something 200,000 to 400,000 per year per patient. Okay, This is standard orphan drug pricing, but again, you can see what happens in terms of the sensitivity analysis to the net present value of the investment based on pricing. So we're, of course, doing pricing analysis now as well. That means reimbursement analysis. You know, you can think about the complexity of this, and what entrepreneur knows how to do this? They, they just don't. So then this is the last two slides. Uh, actually, it just shows you that we do a cash on cash analysis, which is the way we get paid primarily, and an IRR analysis, which is what brings our LPs to the table and brings them back to our next fund. This shows the exit, uh, what the sale price of the company. For companies this stage, the best um, comparables available show uh, a mean and a median of 400 to 500 million. So we would expect this company to sell for between 400 and 500 million by the end of 2012. And you can see what happens, obviously, at 400 million, it's a 2.8x cash on cash and a 65% IRR. Um, when I put this, we did this both for the overall investment, so the previous series A, B, and C, as well as the new money. And we did it just for the new money, because, of course, you know how this works. Any new money you put in, you analyze that separately. Right? Is it worth doing that? It's going to have a much better return than the earlier money, but we have to look at the blended return because that's what our, uh, what our uh, LPs are going to get. So there you go. Valuation analysis on the M&A scenario rather than the IPO. This, again, just shows um, sensitivity analysis. We're always doing sensitivity analysis. What if we get the first indication? <coughs> what if we get both indications? What are you know, the expenses behind that, and what's the overall company valuation? So our assessment is it's going to range between 225 and 834. Post money on the last financing was 138 million. We're going to put 40 million in one way or the other, the IPO or the Series D. So you've got you know, almost 200 million in, and you just basically get return of principal in the down case, and you get a 4x return in the up case. And here we are at the end of this investment, sweating it out between now and the end of next year, September, December of 2012. We don't know the outcome. And it's been like this all the way along, managing uncertainty. That's the venture capital model. 
And then this just goes ahead and shows you the M&A return. And you can see that uh, at 400, we're obviously way better off with the M&A than we are with the IPO process. You know, it's a 3.4x, 75% IRR, and a $400 million exit. But guess what? We had a major row with our other investors because we want to do the private round. We want to do the M&A exit. And we don't want to be a public company with the risk of the FDA making a decision. They're going to make one in September of this year, one in December of this year, and one in September of next year. And you guys know what happens when you get a funny Padufa date or you get uh, a complete response letter instead of an approvable letter. You know, stocks at $10 go to 50 cents. And you don't want to be public. We don't want to be public with an investment that we're holding in that situation. Uh, and we've got the reserves. We argued strenuously to keep this private and do the, uh, uh, and do the um, uh, Series D financing, and we were outvoted by other members of the syndicate. Uh, that they just don't have the capacity. They're too late in their fund, and they don't have the reserves, and they can't protect their investment. And when they model their returns, they're better off in the IPO setting because they can't defend their investment further. So, you know, the, uh, uh, I'd call those externalities. And of course, we have to do new investments with these people in the future. We can't crush them, even if we could control it, because they won't invest with us again. So this, there's a dynamic all the time. It's, it's a wonderfully complex, interesting, and entertaining way to uh, use valuation. I hope that you know, the things I talked about you know, stimulate some thought. And uh, it really, I didn't want to come here and do anything on theory, right? Because that's, look, we, we all had the same theory. And, got wonderful professors and great data. But I hoped sort of a practicum uh, would be of interest to you. So uh, we're open for questions now. Right. Right. Well, they think so now because they're outsourcing. Yeah, repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what is the success rate or the attrition rate for pharmaceutical product development, particularly as you go through the value chain uh, or the drug development process? And are they more or less efficient and effective than the venture model? Uh, and as a consequence, what's been the behavior and the return for pharma? And uh, it's case by case, product by product, but in a blended rate. Um, you know, you see their returns, uh, the return on equity, for example, of those firms. They are moving to outsource as much of the discovery and early development as they can. What they really view as their core competency now is global, massive end development and distribution and commercialization. You know, you give them a product, and to me, I showed you modeling for Vivaldi in the U.S. market. They can simultaneously go to all the global markets. They have to run the regulatory hoops, but we, we can't even think about doing a trial in Europe. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the people. We don't have the capital. So think how much more valuable that product is in their hands than it is in our hands. That's why we run the models the way we do. I just showed you the US data. We've run it for the rest of the world as well. So it's all upside if we can demonstrate the proof of concept for this platform. Question? I'm walking closer because I, I can't hear very well. I'll try to talk louder. You, you touched on it a little bit, I think, in one of the slides. But maybe we could talk a little bit about how you try to factor in the impact of healthcare reform at the Healthcare Reform Act, given how much uncertainty there is about the A, whether that will happen, and what the impact of that will be as a, as a sum of your modeling. Political question or economic question? <laughs> <laughs> no attribution to party. You figured out my, you've, you've figured out my politics, right? Doug, you're, you're an, a lecturer at Wharton, right? And you're a community organizer, so I think you're qualified to be president. Um, <laughs> health, <laughs> health, healthcare, healthcare reform uh, is killing innovation. It's an anti-innovation platform and program. It's awful for the venture model. Uh, so 
I've, I've uh, spent a fair amount of time looking um, across industries at, uh, um, at how innovation is funded. And, and, um, it turns out that it's a, it's a filtration problem, as of course you know, and, and healthcare. And even if we're talking about movies or, or books, it's still a filtration problem. We start out with cannon fodder at the bottom, and eventually you get a very small number of, uh, right. of returns, like the blockbuster movie. So the question I have is that when you have business, when you have pharma, when you have um, the government, um, a lot of R&D disappears out of, um, out of the public eye. I mean, a lot of groups of, of R&D disappear, as it has to. Yes. Um, as as uh, the, the bigness starts to break up across the board, uh, more of, of the process is becoming visible to, to everybody, basically. Um, so the question I have is that um, funding this, uh, whether you look at the oil industry, or uh, uh, involves a progressive group of, of people with, with lower and lower risk tolerances. Um, and the risk has to be compressed at, at each level of the game. So it's to, to line up essentially the filters, or whatever you want to call it, the, the, the people who make up the, the last stage um, is, seems to me to be a real problem wherever how do you find these people? How do you know what the risk tolerances are? How do they know what the risk tolerances are? How do you educate them as to why, given what you believe their risk tolerances to be, that this is a reasonable investment for them? Um, so you've done this with respect to, you and your peers have done this with, with respect to pharma. In general, I'd like to have your commentary. First of all, am I off base? And, and if not, can you give me a sense of uh, you know, what you would recommend in terms of understanding this problem? Okay, so the question is generally about risk tolerance and people who are only really conditioned to take lower risk later stage investments, so how are we going to get the work done earlier uh, so that we continue to have a pipeline and innovation? I hope that's a fair that's paraphrasing. That's a okay, so the model is generally uh, a lot like wildcat oil drilling or, or um, what happens with the studios uh, in Hollywood where you've got scripts and screenwriters and everybody uh, you know out there trying to create an early stage product that Paramount or whoever it is these days Warner Brothers will will commercialize right uh, or you drill a thousand wells for two or three big ones uh, that's you know that's not a good business model but that's the business model of biotech people sometimes make fun of us and say, you know, this is the future, the, this is the industry of the future and always will be. Uh, it's been really difficult uh, as this, uh, you know, as this novel innovation-based technology has, has developed over the last 40 years. I'm still bullish and think it's a wonderful thing to do and that it has a lot of principled promise uh, for economic return. Um, you, you do it through education. You've got to educate legislators. Uh, you've got to leave space in the P&L and pricing for, um, uh, you know, for the pharma industry to be able to afford the long-term risk capital for innovation. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a big subject. Uh, a lot's been said about it. But I, you know, I think it's an education process as much as anything. In, in pharmaceutical drug development? Well, you know, we started in the 1950s where all you had to do was show safety. There was no showing of efficacy. Then we had um, uh, emergence of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and the Public Health Service Act, and it's become more and more scientific, the evaluation and demonstration of the uh, benefit risk nowadays of any new innovations. Uh, and there's lots of heterogeneity in, in the population. So uh, what works for your brother doesn't work for you and may not work at all for your neighbor based on your genetic background and, and uh, your, your susceptibility to you know, the interactions between your biochemistry and your body and, and those, those drugs. As that complexity became more evident, um, the regulatory process became more scientific and it's become much more extensive and expensive. Uh, and uh, I think if you look at the data of how many drugs have been approved annually versus what's been the R&D spend uh, at NIH and in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you see that the, the approvals have been 
dramatically decreasing for the last 20 years, and the expense has been dramatically increasing. And so I, I have that data, but I didn't show it today, and it's a quantitative approach to um, the change you're talking about. I'd say the last 15, 20 years, uh, it's accelerated. Let me take one more quick question, because we promised people that they had to by nine, and then Doug, I don't know what your schedule's like, but perhaps you can see it. I, I, I can. Orphan drug investment is uh, very appealing uh, because uh, it's, um, you know, there's good pricing uh, opportunity. But whether or not, um, you know, what society's role should be in paying these extraordinarily expensive uh, treatments for an extraordinarily small number of people uh, is a different issue. Uh, who's going to pay for it? How's it going to be paid? It's the same cost to develop that drug, the same risk of failure that we talked about. and. Uh, we are interested in it. Uh, from a humanitarian point of view, it's, it's an interesting issue. From a social, from, uh, uh, you know, you can think about it, um, uh, whether, whether or not we should be doing it, when we're rationing care, essentially, uh, for the larger population. But as an investment, we think it's a very fruitful investment right now because um, the, the, the advocacy groups uh, and uh, the political support that's available allows the kind of pricing uh, that I showed earlier on that slide of three, four hundred thousand dollars a year for one person for chronic medication. It's nine o'clock right now, uh, so we're going to let uh, all of you go. Doug, thank you so much for uh, thanks, Herb. Uh, thank you.